for example. And so bigger people, there's more of you and you burn more calories. Smaller people burn few, fewer calories. Even after you account for body size uh, and age and anything, anything like that, you're still going to see people who, you know, you know, you and I may be similar age, similar size, but it wouldn't be a, a surprise to anybody if you burned 200 calories more a day than I did or, or vice versa, or even 300 calories difference, right? There's just that much variability in metabolic rates. And it's not tied to lifestyle in any obvious way, right? There's actually a lot of variances that we just don't, can't explain. What's interesting is if people, so if we measure, if we were to ask you, do you have a faster, slow metabolism? Yeah. yeah you might have an answer to that. If we get you into the lab and measure it, I, you know, the odds that your experience of if you think you have a faster metabolism or not actually matches if you do have a fast <laughs> it's metabolism. Not, it's not it, very it, good. <laughs> not, a, not a very good likelihood there. Because, you know, when people say I have a fast metabolism, they usually mean I can eat whatever I want. I don't get, I don't see, feel like I, I gain weight. It, mm. Or if I have a slow metabolism, oh, I feel like no matter what I do, I gain weight. And that's a different question than how many calories you burn every day. Yeah, well, I was going to say, I mean, in terms of when we talk about appetite regulation. I mean, if we shift gears to the brain, I mean, certainly this is having an effect of people who are feel more satiated and actually they feel like they're eating whatever they want, but they're actually not feeding that many opportunities in a day versus somebody else. Yeah. Can you speak to the brain's role there uh, in terms of appetite regulation and, and perhaps from an evolutionary standpoint as well? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so again, your brain is really good at matching calories in the calories out. And, you know, the, the systems that do that are, are pretty well known uh, at some level now we're kind of learning more all the time but obesity getting overweight and obese is usually an issue sort of a creeping regulation issue where you're just a little bit off mm -hmm. and we're talking like less than a ten, you know like a tenth of a percent off like tiny amounts wow a little bit off in terms of intake versus expenditure on average and so you gain a couple pounds a year well you gain a couple pounds a year you go from being a healthy weight 20 year old to being an overweight or obese 40 year old i mean that's that is the American global, that's the American obesity epidemic. And I think it's becoming the, the global epidemic, right? Absolutely. And so this is a brain regulation issue. And, you know, the evidence for that is, is sort of the way that, that it develops. But also, for example, if you look at the, at the genetics of obesity, so people have, you know, I think that there, this isn't work that my lab does, but people who work on uh, genetic variants and uh, the genetics of obesity, I think there's almost a thousand different genes who, you know, depending oh. on which variant you have of, of this gene or that gene affects your likelihood of, of becoming obese. And all of those genes, with few exceptions, are most active in your brain, right? Interesting. So it's not your liver, it's not your muscles, it's not your fat cells, it's not, no, it's your brain. And it's because those, that, that's where the, the rubber hits the road. How well do you track and, and match intake to expenditure? Yeah, and you talk about in the book, you know, the heads obviously with you know, getting honey or getting a piece of fruit yeah. was pretty exciting. You know, to get that sweet taste out in nature isn't something that you normally stumble upon. And so it always brings me back. Actually, there's a, I'm over here in the UK. There was a picture of the beach on a hot day in 1976 and everybody's out there. And of course, everybody looks sort of slim or normal BMI. And then just recently, it was the last year, it was a really hot day, same picture. And again, you know, you're up to 50, 60%. So when we talk about this, this food environment and, and, and that evolutionary hangover of wanting yeah. to keep eating. I mean, how, how can we resolve this when, just as you mentioned, where we, it looks like it's becoming a global, global issue. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so, you know, we just talked about how the genetics are involved, but of course the genetics, the gene pool hasn't changed from that picture of the 1950s to today, right? The genetics yeah. changes, gene pools change much more slowly. So it's obviously a change of the environment and, it, and it's the food environment. I think all evidence points to it's the food environment. And, and the big problem is, well, it's probably a lot of things, but if you had to point your finger at one thing, it's this predominance, ultra processed foods, right? These engineered combinations of salty, sweet, right? Mm. Fatty, crisp, you know, it, it's this, this melange of flavors and textures that our bodies, your brains are never evolved to experience, Light right? Up. A Hadza man or woman never experiences a Domino's pizza or a <laughs> fried ice cream or, you know, a, a deep fried Snickers bar or something like that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's, imp it, it just completely overreacts, right? It's the reward systems go, go crazy. And in it's, it's, people have shown us it's, it's basically similar to addiction, right? It's, it's similar in that in your, in response to addiction and, and you overeat because you're, it's engineered to make you overeat. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. It's fascinating. I mean, over here in the UK, Canada, the U S I mean, it's more than 50% of everything we buy is ultra processed food. Yes. Um, 
and I find over here, I mean, you take a train to Paris, it's two hours away, and all of a sudden it's 14%. You know, you wow, go is it really that low? Yeah, you I go didn't around realize the Mediterranean, it was that, I, yeah, like 16%. Yeah. And so, even when I hear about you know the Mediterranean diet, obviously, sort of like the quote unquote gold standard of, of healthy diets, if you will, but it seems like the theme, of course, across all these different countries is, is just they're eating more real food, right? Yeah, that's absolutely it. And you know, I think in some ways that's a story we've heard before. But I think, you know, what I try to do in the book and what I think, you know, hopefully more recent research is kind of pointing out is that really is the nub of it, you know, because what happens is we say, oh, it's ultra processed food. And Coca-Cola says, oh, sure, sure, sure. But you better make sure you exercise too. And it might also be that, oh, it's carbs, not fats, or it's fats, not carbs. And all this kind of smoke screen, screen stuff goes up, mm -hmm. right? To obscure what is a pretty simple message, which is these engineered foods that are literally engineered this is how they know they're doing a good job as you overeat them right that's what we're surrounded with so um if you had to do one thing if you could wave your magic wand it would get rid of those processed foods yeah 100 percent. and if we circle back to your book and the benefits of exercise you know you go through obviously the metabolism and you're talking about how there's not this big effect but you obviously you you, you pump the brakes to everyone and say look it doesn't mean you can't exercise um, or you shouldn't exercise rather and yeah. you, know, you talk about the, the benefits can you just revisit some of the, the benefits as, as it relates to metabolism oh. and, and healthy weight yeah sure 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 um so yeah that's right so just because um, exercise by itself isn't a great tool for weight loss um, and might not even get your daily energy expenditure to change very much because your body makes those adjustments that's actually those adjustments are actually what's good for you. They're part, part of what's so good for you. So we can, we can first of all say that there are a lot of benefits of exercise that have nothing to do with the calories burned, right? That have nothing to do with, with calories at all. So stronger muscles, uh, sharper mind, right? Uh, better immune function, getting outside. If you're exercising, out there, there's, there's, there's mood effects, right? So sure. there's all these great effects that have nothing to do with calories and you should exercise. If it was only that, you should exercise for those alone. But the calorie stuff is actually really exciting because it turns out that all those calories you burn on exercise, the big effect is that those are calories that are taken away from other functions. That's the way you can think about it, right? So if you spend a lot of energy on, on exercise, your body's going to spend less energy on inflammation. It's going to spend less energy on stress reactivity. Uh, we think it's going to help keep your reproductive hormones in a sort of safer, at a safer range. And so, you know, those are all really good things, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that, that's, that's just adds to why, in other words, the metabolic adjustments don't take away from why you should exercise. They actually add to why you should exercise. <laughs>